there's a thank you card uh, from Rayburn and Anna. So very, so here's a very special thanks to warmly let you know your thoughtfulness means so much more than any words could show. Thank you. And that has come from Rayburn and Anna. And then thank you from all of us, Pastor Betty, Pastor Mike, church family. We all want to express our warmest and most sincere thanks. Thank you for the love and kindness you've shown during our time of loss. Your prayers and support were deeply felt and meant so much to us. Thank you to all who provided food and organized the reception following the service. It was greatly appreciated. And that's from Marilyn and family. And so we want to continue to remember those who need a little bit of encouragement today, an extra special touch, healing touch from the Lord. It's so good to be able to pray for one another and encourage one another in the good times and also in the difficult times. And uh, with God's help, that's what we plan to do again in this new year, right? With the Lord's strength and help. Uh, good to be with you today. Hello, beautiful people. Remember, I was going to start using that, that phrase. Hello, beautiful. I should do it in a little bit of an Italian accent, but I won't. Hello, beautiful people. For those who are, for those who don't know that, I watch a YouTube on uh, a family in Sicily, Italy, and he always opens his video. Hello, beautiful people. And so I feel this need to do that. Hello, beautiful people. Um, and uh, it's, Pastor Mike and I did have a wonderful uh, vacation, and it was nice to have our daughter Tina with us, and she returned home safely, so we give God praise for that. And thank you for your prayers for us, and many have been asking, Pastor, did you have a good week off? And that shows that you are concerned that I have a good week off. So yes, yes we did, and thank you very much for that. I heard you had a great Sunday last Sunday. Are you going to stay on track? <laughs> I told you he was quite a man, not retired, but retired. At 97 years of age, still preaching the Word of God. He inspires me and challenges me and uh, challenges all of us. So today, uh, it is that first uh, Sunday officially of the month, and so it is Potluck Sunday. And so it's time to have lunch together and fellowship downstairs. We will uh, meet at the Lord's table today and, and have communion and break bread together. The early church did that. And then they had a meal. Actually, the early church did it the opposite. They had a meal together, and then they broke bread together at the end of the meal. We're just doing it reverse. We're going to break bread together in the service, and then go downstairs and break bread together and have a lunch together. Now, here's the key. I made a big pot of good old Luffy uh, beef and vegetable soup. And so it's down on the stove downstairs. I made extra. And there is no gluten in it, and there's no dairy in it. So I'm telling you that to say, come and eat some of the pastor's soup for lunch. You're more than welcome to join us for lunch today. There's always extra food, and if there isn't, we pray over it, the Lord multiplies it, and we all have enough. And we would love to have you stay for lunch today. Don't feel like you have to have something to be able to stay. You have received an invitation uh, just to mark your calendars, on the end of the month, January 26th, will be family gym night again at the Du Bois School. And I heard the last one went really well. I'm hoping to be there this time, and it is a great night of fellowship and fun and just being active in the middle of winter. Uh, there's an item that Carol has asked me to bring to your attention. We have people who have been giving faithfully to the church, and you've been putting it in envelopes and sending money, but she does not have your full name and does not have your up-to-date address. And so she is needing that information in the church office by the end of the month when she does up the tax receipts. So if you could have that uh, to her in the office, she would appreciate that. It is the week where everything resumes. Isn't that good? So this week, ladies, Bible study resumes, and, and Amanda has informed us it's session five of chapter six. You get that? Five of chapter six. Closing group resumes. Praise the Lord. A lot of us enjoy cooking. You can bring any handiwork, any, any kind of uh, craft that you like to be a part of and join in on that group. Midweek study resumes, and Pastor Mike will be looking at You Are the Salt and the Light. Kids Connection. Kids Connection resumes on Wednesday. And so uh, make sure you get the word out for the kids to come out on Wednesday night 
Uh, maybe there's some that have not heard that it resumes this week, and let's get the word out. Also, calendars are available, and you can pick those up. And it's going to be a good month in the house of the Lord. Man, you guys are just excited about it. <laughs> it's going to be a good month in the house Amen. of the Lord. Amen. Because, not because of us, but because of him. Would you stand to your feet? I had this this morning, Pastor Mike, and I read this and prayed this morning, and I wanted to share it with you as our call to worship. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. This was our prayer today that we read. I pray for the gospel community as it gathers today. Lord, you told us to ask the Father to send out workers to bring in the harvest. This we must do. Please ignite a renewed passion for the gospel in our lives and a sense of urgency in our churches. May we preach the way of salvation clearly today so that many might see and believe and put their trust in you. Mobilize us as a missionary movement wherever we live and to every tribe and tongue. Holy Spirit, renew us again. Come to us once more as you came to that first prayer room in Jerusalem. Did you get that? Holy Spirit, renew us again. Come to us once more as you came to that first prayer room in Jerusalem. That gets me excited. That we might be propelled out of our meetings and into the streets with new courage to preach the gospel. That thousands might encounter the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, this day. And this is the prayer. May this day bring Sabbath rest to my heart and my home. May God's image in me be restored and my imagination in God restore me. May the gravity of material things be lightened and the relativity of time slow down. And may I know grace to embrace my own finite smallness. In the, God, in the arms of God's infinite greatness, may God's word feed me and his spirit lead me into this new week and into the life to come. That is our prayer today. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, come as you did on that first Pentecost, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. God bless you as we worship him today. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And we start by singing, holy, holy, holy. Now I see you, you sound like to gravitate to the back. So you need to make sure your voice is hitting you right at the front. So you've got a long way to travel. So I need to hear these. Okay? God bless you today. Let's sing, holy, holy, holy.
I was sitting down there, and when we were singing different songs, all I could think of was Jesse Ashley. And I mean, I didn't remember Jesse Ashley as a little girl, but I remember the name of her, I did. But I remember waving the white flag going up the yard. And I did everything I could to sit there. Because I was thinking, people would think I was crazy if I started marching in Iowa. But this is all the stuff going through my head. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine what heaven's going to be like when we get to go marching all around in the <laughs> you know, And I shouldn't care. I shouldn't care when I'm serving in a Hallelujah. That's right. I shouldn't. Amen. Thank you, Lord. But man alive, I'm blessed to be given the privilege and the honor to serve the Lord. Holy Spirit. 
after this next song is our communion song. It's a song to prepare our hearts. We get to move into his presence, and I believe his presence is already here this morning. Praise God. You may be seated. And uh, Sunday is when we celebrate the resurrection. Sunday is the first day of the week. And we're being obedient in the fact that we're giving God what? Our first day. This morning when we come together, we're giving God our first. We're practicing. We're practicing the resurrection, waiting for the day of our resurrection. And so we give God our best. We give him our first. We give him this first day of this week. I don't know what this year holds. I don't know what this week holds. But I know who's already there. And I know he is holy forever and worthy of my worship and praise. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This first Sunday of 2024, this first Sunday of this week, we have gathered in his name in this place to worship him. And now we come to his table. Isn't that fitting that this first Sunday of the year, we meet at his table. We come to receive the emblems of his suffering and death. We come to partake of it, that it becomes a part of who I am. It becomes a part of my spiritual DNA, that the suffering of Christ is something I want to be a part of, that I might also experience the power of his resurrection. That's my prayer for 2024. See, there is no power and there is no resurrection without being with him in his suffering being alongside of him, <coughs> mindful of him, willing to count the cost to follow Christ. Now, I'm not going to preach, I'm preaching. So we'll leave that there. Uh, at this time, if you have not received the envelopes, we would love you. This is an open table. What we mean by the open table is if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are welcome, not to our table, you are welcome to his table. And all are welcome to come and receive today these emblems of his suffering and death. If you have not received the cup today to participate with us in communion, would you raise your hand and our usher will see that you get one. Anyone needing the cup? Everyone on the platform? Oh, up here on the platform. We want everyone to be able to uh, receive and partake after we sing this song. And as we sing this song, may it be a song of prayer for this day, this Sunday, this week, but may it also be a prayer uh, as we take these emblems and of this new year that God has given us, 2024. <laughs>
You may be seated. I've come to realize that my need for God, how do I word this, has a lot to do with my experience with God. I believe God is always present, always waiting. He is present with us now. Revelation tells us, I love that, when it says that he walks amongst the lampstands. The lampstands are the churches. His light in a dark world. Christ is present every time we gather, every, every moment that we are here in his name. He is present. But my experience of his presence I believe, hinges on my need for him. And I look back at 2023 and think of the times, openly confess, think of the times when probably God would have showed up in a greater way in my life if I was that desperate for him. We just sang about being as desperate for God as the very air we breathe. Wanting and hungering for him like we would eat on a daily basis. And so I encourage you today, as this first Sunday of this year, <clears throat> as we come to his table, I pray you're desperate for him. You're desperate for him to show up. You're desperate for him to move. You're desperate for him to be exalted and glorified in Canada, in our government, in our schools, in our families, in the prodigals, and everything around us. You want to see Jesus. That's what we've been saying this morning. We want <laughs> all glory to go to him. We want to see him high and exalted. But you know where it starts? Right here. In this moment, in our hearts, in our lives, we're the first fruits of what God is wanting to do. Right? We're the first fruits. We're not any better than anyone else. It's just that our eyes have been open and we've seen the truth and it has set us free. And we are the first fruits. And so in faith today, we gather and worship, and we also partake of this emblem of his suffering and death, because we are partaking it as the fruits, first fruits, of what God is wanting to do in our lives, in our family, in our community, in our neighborhood, in West Prince at the corner. We're standing in faith. We're standing in the gap. We're believing God that as we partake of this emblem, like those who have gone ahead of us and have been faithful, we too will be faithful in belief that there's a generation, if the Lord carries, there's a generation coming behind us who will fill this church, who will partake also of this emblem of the Lord's suffering and death. And so what we do, my friends, is important. And uh, I know that this communion supper was instituted by our Lord, not by us, the Savior Jesus Christ, and it is a sacrament which proclaims his life, his suffering, his sacrificial death, and resurrection, and the hope of his coming again. It shows forth the Lord's death until he returns. This supper is a means of God's grace, where Christ is now present by his Spirit. It is received in reverent appreciation and gratefulness for the work of Christ. That's why we slow things down and we pray. All those who are truly repentant, forsaking their sins, and believing in Christ for salvation are invited to participate in the death and resurrection of Christ. We come to the table that we may be renewed in life and salvation and be made one by the Spirit. The unity with the church, we confess our faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. So pray that with me. We confess our faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, we now come to this table simply and humbly, realizing that we have been recipients of your grace. We are no better than anyone else, Lord. We have come and we have had our eyes open to see. We have confessed our sins. We have come to you for forgiveness. And you have truly set us free. And for that, we are appreciative. You slow us down, Lord, when we come to this table. Our eyes are now focused again on the real thing, what it's all about, what you went through for us. And our eyes are also focused forward to the glorious hope of the future resurrection. We thank you, Lord, that you have done all that is necessary for our salvation. We don't need to do a thing except accept it. Lord, if there's anything that uh, we need forgiveness for today, I pray in this moment we would confess that to you, O oh God. Quietly, we would give on to you those things, maybe, Lord, the sins of commission, things that we have done that would not be pleasing in your sight, words that we have said we probably shouldn't have. But, Lord, I also pray for the sins of omission, where there were things we could have done in 2023 that we neglected, Lord. We now lay it all at your feet, Lord. Thank you for this moment of cleansing. Thank you for this moment uh, of, of giving us a new fresh start, a new fresh beginning into this new week and into this new year. And it is good for us to be in your presence. And it is good for us to be at your table. Be present with us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Taking the bread. This body of mine has fallen apart. Probably a few of you would say that. Praise God, the outer is falling apart, but the inner is being renewed daily. This body of mine, though, will one day be a new body, and it will be totally restored and renewed, and praise God for that, because his body was nailed to that tree for me. And because he was willing to take that pain and that suffering in his body, this body of mine, though it will be laid down and laid into a coffin, one day it will be gloriously new on the day when that trump shall sound and the Lord shall come. So take this, eat this, and be truly thankful for what the Lord has done for you. Let's eat together. Thank you, Lord. Taking the cup. There were different cups at the Passover feast, and one of the cups that they would pass was called the cup of suffering. Many believe that is the cup that was used to remember our Lord, or was the cup of suffering in the Passover feast. And so we realize that our Lord suffered for us. This cost him dearly, that our sins could be cleansed. That we could be set free from our past and our shame. That even now we can be freshly renewed and forgiven. That's why we call this a table of grace. That God's grace is present even here today. That as you partake of this symbol of his suffering and death, he wants to renew you. He wants to cleanse you. There is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. You don't need to shed blood. He did it for you. All you need to do is receive partake, and be truly thankful. Let's receive this emblem of our Lord's suffering and death. Let's drink together. Kenny, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to pray today. The Holy Spirit says you're supposed to pray for us and give thanks. Yeah, Father, we thank you for another opportunity to be in your house this morning, God. Yes. We thank you for... You're, what you've done and you, the work on the cross for us this morning, God, and that we are so able to come here so freely and so openly without fear right. of anyone coming in and destroying this place or our lives in the day and age we live in today, God. You are so good to us, and we could never thank you and never praise you enough, God. So right. we just ask for your anointing upon our pastor as she uh, preaches the message here this morning, God. And if there be anyone in this place this morning who does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, God, may this be the day. May they not put it off any longer and take that chance, God. There's no reason to. So we just ask for 
you to, to uh, just wash through this place in a special way this morning with your spirit, God. And we'll give, be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for everything that will be accomplished in this place today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. At this time, Ellen's going to come and read our scripture for us. And I believe after she reads the scripture, the kids can go down to Junior Church. <coughs> Today I've been thinking about, I've been mulling over this week, about the unseen scene. That seems to be a play in words, the unseen scene. <clears throat> and uh, you know, we, we make this statement, right? We'll, we'll, we'll have a couple statements. For those that English is your second language, you'll try to understand some of these. Believing is seeing. You know, you've used that term. But this is the term I've heard more growing up, is seeing is believing. Right? We've all heard that statement. Seeing is believing. And so the idea of this, the possible interpretation, is the idea here is that uh, we usually think something is true when we see it with our own eyes. We have to see something before we can accept it's a real value or that it exists at all. So that is something we say in English, you know, seeing is believing. And, and so today, you know, we're, we're looking at the reality of sight, but we're not talking so much about physical sight as we're talking about insight, as we're talking about, we will often say, the eyes of your heart, right? The eyes of your heart. And, and so we're looking at this reality of seeing is believing, and I'm playing on words a bit, and as time goes on, hopefully you get it. The unseen is now seen. Now, Zacchaeus was a small, little, wee little man, right? We love this story. We grew up, any of us that grew up in the church, we've grown up in Sunday school, and we've heard about Zacchaeus, the wee little man, right? We always think he's just a wee little guy. And, uh, you know, it's just interesting as we look at that, right, this wee little man. And, and I have come to find out in PEI there's some wee little people. I won't mention any names. And uh, I was thinking this week, and I, I was wondering if I should tell the story or not. It just came to me, and I'll tell it. But uh, when, I, when I used to go to Cuba, and I love our Cuban brothers and sisters, and in the Church of the Nazarene at the time, and even now it's difficult, the U.S. couldn't go into Cuba. So they asked the Canadian church, if we would care for Cuba, we would go into Cuba. And now they went into Cuba a lot and did work and witness teams. And work and witness teams would come in and better a home, a pastor's home, or better a church. And then the government would take it over again. So they realized, well, work and witness teams is not really what Cuba needs. And they do, do some small jobs. But what they needed was teams to go down and build relationships with the Cubans. And so I had the opportunity twice to go down and be with the pastors and their families and bring goods down to them and be at their district assembly two times. And Cuba's always meant a lot to me and the Cuban brothers and sisters mean a lot to me. But it was kind of comical 
because I'm called like an Italian, and they, they struggled with the name Betty, so I'm Bettina, right? Bettina is my name in Italian. And so they, they would call me in Cuba, they all talked about, apparently before I would show up, they were talking about me, Bettina, Bettina, Betty, Bettina. And so what, what made me chuckle was a lot of our Cuban friends would be like Zacchaeus, they're not very tall. And I would come into assembly and they finally would introduce me as Bettina. Now Tina means what? Tiny. So Betty the tiny one. <laughs> And they would look at me, they would go, is that Bettina? <laughs> Literally, you know, you'd, you'd hug them and now not, a lot of them are, are quite tall, but there's just a few of them that aren't. And it was just comical to see that when they would look at me and they would say, well, you're not very tiny. And I was like, no, I'm not, thank you very much. That's just what I wanted to hear. <clears throat> but see, children love the story of Zacchaeus. One of the reasons why we like the story of Zacchaeus it is because children can often feel overlooked and ignored and left out. I, I often was challenged with this a few years ago, and I still try to do it when I'm mindful of it. Sometimes when you will come in as a family and there will be children or grandchildren involved, I will go to the grandchild at first and shake their hand at first if I'm mindful of it. What does that say to a child? You're important. You're important here. They, they tell us, too, for children to help them is when you get down on their level and look at them face to face. Because children uh, admire the story of Zacchaeus because children can often feel like they're added on, that the church isn't for them. Church is for mom and dad, and somehow we're a take-along. Sometimes children will feel overlooked and left out. And I remember I was challenged all the times that I did it as a mother. Mom, 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 you're not looking at me. Mom, you're not listening to me. What is it? What is it? You know, we get so busy in life. We get so busy in the things of life that we can often overlook the needs of our children. And they feel unheard and unseen. Much like Zacchaeus did in the story. Well, here's the point today. You know what? You can feel that way as an adult. You can often feel that way as an adult. You can often feel lonely. We've had this discussion before as a church. You can feel lonely in a crowd. You can feel unseen, unvalued, unheard. As if you were walking around invisible. And so the story of... Uh, Zacchaeus is also important for us. Not seen, not recognized, overlooked, lonely, and left out. One of the things we realized today was Zacchaeus had a life that wasn't hmm, too great like many of us. And so he's almost embarrassed to get too close to Jesus. Do you realize there's a lot of people today in our community and our families that their life has been squandered and such a mess that they're almost too embarrassed to come to church. They're almost too embarrassed to show any concern for the things of God. They feel that they have gone too far. That was very much, most likely, how Zacchaeus felt. Not worthy enough. And so he checks Jesus out at a distance. Do you realize a lot of people, we've had this conversation, I haven't said too much, but there's a lot of people that use our service online to check out Jesus at a distance. Because, heaven forbid, they somehow feel that they can't get close enough. They've gone too far. They've gone and squandered their lives. And somehow, there is a desire to be closer to the things of God. But they do it at a distance. We see very much that in this gospel, that Zacchaeus had done a lot of things that he wasn't proud of. Jericho was a wealthy, wealthy city. <laughs> Luke loves to deal with the danger of riches. And, and I believe there's a whole different message, but I believe we're dealing in a day, and West Prince especially, when we're dealing with affluency. And affluency, God can bless you. Praise God, hallelujah. Send some blessing my way, Lord. But affluency has the danger to take you away from God. To take you down paths that you don't want to go. 
And so God wants to bless you with blessing that you might be a blessing to others. But you need to be wise. You need to stay on track, as we heard last week. When affluency comes knocking at your door. And so Luke is concerned as he talks about the passage about the rich young ruler. And now we see this story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is this tax collector. He's not just a tax collector. He is the chief tax collector. He's the head honcho of tax collecting. And so he is in bed with Rome, the enemy. And so he has sold his soul for what? Money. He wants money. He wants more and more and more money. And so he becomes very, very wealthy, but wealthy at the cost of others. And you would say his morals have been totally gone. And so he is seen by the people as the worst of the worst. He is a traitor, an opportunist, and he's greedy. Therefore, he is the most hated in that beautiful town of Jericho. Jericho was a crossroad town. It was a town of trade, therefore the perfect place for the seat of Roman taxation. It was known for its beautiful palm forests and balsam groves and roses, and so it was known to be perfumed. It was beautiful to walk around, but there was somebody there that there was a stench over his morals, and that would be indeed Zacchaeus. But you know what the key is here? The key is here today. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. The man whose life was marked by physical and metaphorical shortcomings. He was not only short in stature, but also in vision of his life's true purpose. There's something within him that is percolating. He is desiring to see Jesus and to know more. And despite all the wealth that he had and, and all that he had done and all the portraying and the people scorn in their eyes, he was someone in society who was looked down. His figure had been diminished by his actions and his stature, but, hear the but that Luke is presenting? But he desired to see Jesus. He desired to see Jesus. Nobody, as we said in Jericho, liked Zach. We're going to call him Zach. As chief tax collector, he skimmed the taxes that went to Rome. But he also skimmed the money from the other tax collectors under him. Imagine the people as they watch this guy. They're watching him and his wealth begins to accumulate more and more. And they watch his fancier home. And they watch his servants that he hires. And they begin to watch his fine clothes as he prances around town. And they realize that they paid for it all. Unfairly. They were injustice is going on. And they can't do a thing about it. And to make things worse, this man called Jesus comes to town, and instead of meeting with the righteous, he chooses to meet with Zacchaeus. Can you imagine the people, what they were thinking in that moment? As Jesus is coming through town, and they realize that he says, I'm coming to your house today, Zacchaeus. The worst of the worst of the worst. Long before Zacchaeus could see Jesus, the tree was already planted to meet his need. I love that statement. You see, everything is put in place for us. Everything is put in place for us. For us to want to see Jesus. God is wanting us to want to see him. God is wanting us to draw close and near to him. And so we begin to realize that the shortcomings of Zacchaeus had a longing. He had a desire to see Jesus. And that longing led him to climb up a sycamore tree. People study have said that tree is very similar to what they call an English oak. It's a huge tree with branches that would go out sideways and so easy to climb up. But not just easy to climb up, also easy to be hidden. And so in that desire to see Jesus, he is longing to see Jesus, but he feels he's not good enough to get close to Jesus. So he watches at a distance, but it's also safe because the crowd 
who would destroy him with their words and their looks, and maybe even fistfights, who knows, are at also at a distance. And so he is there unseen by anybody. He, he's just there watching from a distance, just unseen. I like what Barclay says. There's three stories, three stages to uh, Zach's story. He's wealthy but unhappy. Hello? And yet so many people spend their whole life looking for more wealth and realize that that is the most unhappy place you can be sometimes. Wealth can destroy your happiness. And so he's wealthy. He's got it all. But very, very unhappy. I remember one time watching one of the NFL players, and this NFL player had literally had everything handed to him, and things were going so great, and he shared his testimony that he had a beautiful car, a sports car, and all he wanted to do was to take that sports car over a cliff. And God stopped him and drawn draw him to himself, and he got his life right with the Lord. He had everything that the world would say was important, and he was miserable. It wasn't until he found Christ that his life turned around and he had fulfillment and happiness. It wasn't all the money that was going to do that for him. And so we see that Zach is an outcast. Zach, though, was determined to see Jesus, and so he left everything, and he wouldn't allow anything to stop him, and, and he wouldn't allow even the disgust and the ridicule of the crowd he wouldn't allow his guilt and shame to stop him from going. Barclay says he ran ahead of the crowd and he climbed a tree. Now, I don't know, but that's, that's a bit of, uh, takes a little bit of energy there. And then we're told that afterwards he still took steps to show Jesus and his town that he was a changed man. See, I wish people would get this in the body of Christ, that the world needs to see and know that you're a changed man, that you're a changed woman. You need to be showing people and telling people, look what the Lord has done. And for Zacchaeus, what did it mean? He said to Jesus in, in the house when salvation came to his home, he said, I am going to repay. I'm going to repay all those. I'm going to give half of my money to the poor, and I'm going to repay those I have stolen from. We call that restitution. See, we, we, we belittle grace when we make grace just a simple little prayer. Oh, I, I thank you, Lord, that you died for me, and I receive you into my heart, and I accept you as my Lord. Notice that word, Lord and Savior. And, and, and it's, it is an important prayer. It is the doorway. It is the opening. But there is a cost to following Jesus. And a changed life, people can see it. There's changes that happen in our lives that people take note. Zacchaeus, the whole town, knew that Zacchaeus, the greedy tax collector, traitor in bed with Rome, Jesus shows up and everything changes. Everything. How important that would be when Jesus continued on the way to Jerusalem that the whole town knew that Zacchaeus was a changed man. That he wasn't the man that he was before. And so the important thing for us is to realize that God is in the business of changing people when Jesus shows up. Do you desire this new year to see Jesus? I pray you do been my prayer already. I want to see God in new and fresh ways in 2024. I want my eyes, my spiritual eyes to be open and to see him. I want to see him in people. I want to see him move. I want to see him. And I pray that that's your prayer. Zacchaeus desired to see Jesus. Do you desire today to see Jesus, to see more of him? I love this passage in John 12, 20. Well, there's verses, the whole story is 20 to 50, but it's actually verses 20 to 21. See, there were some Greeks, and these Greeks came, and they were outsiders, and they were on their way to Jerusalem to worship. They were not insiders. They were not part of the Jewish faith. They are Greeks, and they're outsiders, but they are desiring to worship God, and they're on their way to the temple. And the one thing they do is they go to Philip, and they see Philip, and they say to Philip, we serve very polite, we want 
to see Jesus. Sir, can we see Jesus? We want to see Jesus. Oh man, I, I pray, I pray there are people today in this house and even listening online and even in my own heart. Sir, I desire, Lord, I desire to see you more in this year, to see you more in my life, to see you more in my family, to see you more in West Springs. But you know what's amazing here today? Jesus sees Zacchaeus. That just blows me away. Jesus, the unseen is seen. Jesus sees Zacchaeus. When he's trying to hide, when he's trying to look at Jesus from a distance, Jesus sees him and knows him. You see that all throughout the Gospels. We don't have time today to go into that. But the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good, Proverbs tells us. And so that scares me a little bit. That should put some holy fear in my life, that there is nothing hidden from the Lord. Hello? Nothing. Nothing. But it also gives me comfort today to realize that God sees me and knows me. See, Jesus' approach to Zacchaeus shatters societal norms. Jesus saw right through his callous, hard, lonely, greedy heart. And when Jesus reaches the spot where Zacchaeus is perched, hiding up in a tree, he does something extraordinary. He looks up. He stops and he looks up. For perhaps the first time in Zacchaeus' life in a long time, people didn't look down at him, but Jesus looked up at him and saw him. And Jesus knew him by name. And then Jesus invites him, isn't that something? Invites himself into Zacchaeus' home and life. And, and I looked at this and I thought, wow, that is the Lord, that is the Savior that we love and serve. He knows me by name. I don't know if you've had an experience, but I've had several where I have sat in the church. That first Sunday that I accepted the Lord in 1984, Jesus spoke to me. I heard him. I had a sense that he was right there with me. We kind of chuckle about it afterwards because Pastor Mike and I both, not with the Lord, were sitting towards the front of the church together, the two of us, the grandkids sitting back with, with the grandparents. And as we're sitting there, I get up to go to the washroom, and it was the first Sunday that Ian Fitzpatrick had come from Ireland. It was the first Sunday he was in Canada. By the way, he is now retiring soon as our national director. And that Sunday, one thing that stood out to me, I had met him the night before. That pastor knew me by name. That blew me away, and I struggle with names. And so that's something that I keep beating myself up over. But the pastor knew me by name. And as I got up to go to the washroom, I didn't even sit next to Mike. I sat in the pew ahead of him. That's how out of what was going on around me that the Holy Spirit was working on my heart and soul. And I heard Jesus sit. I had a sense that he was sitting next to me. And I heard him speak in my ear and say, Betty, if you take the first step, I'm with you all the way. That Sunday when I came to faith, they uh, said afterwards, it looked like I was propelled to the altar. That something was carrying me to the altar. They had never seen anything like it. That Sunday I went to the altar. My friends, I'm not saying about physical sight. You know, my, I'm looking forward to the day when my eyes will see him. But there's experiences that God wants to open up the eyes of our hearts to have. And I'm not saying your experience is going to be like my experience. It can be an inkling. It can be a sense. It can be God lays it all out before you. You can read it in scripture and you read it and the same thing is being said. You, you're, you're, you're sensing something and a, a brother or sister in the Lord will come up and say it to you. And you know it's God speaking to you. And I heard him call my name, Betty. That's all I needed to hear. Do you realize today that he knows you by name? That he calls you by name? 
one of our church plants that we had. I shared this once before, but we had this as our model, and I believe it's a wonderful model for a church. And God reminded me of it this week when I was thinking of Zacchaeus. Our church is a place where everybody is a somebody, and Jesus Christ is Lord. My friends, that's the kingdom of God. That's who Jesus is. And if the church has ever presented itself in a different way, if the church of Jesus Christ, I'm not talking about this church, but the church as a whole of Jesus Christ, if they've ever presented it in a way that you are an outsider, that you are not worthy, that, that, that you are uh, an outcast, then I ask that you would forgive us because I pray and I continue to pray that our church would not be known for that, that we would be known as a place where everybody is a somebody because with Jesus Christ, everyone is valued and honored and loved. That's who we are supposed to be as the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus never looks down on anyone. No matter how society perceives them, he sees the unseen, he values the undervalued, and he reaches out to those taught to hide in shame. In Christ's kingdom, everyone is seen. Everyone is known and known by name. Everyone is valued, and everyone is invited. Amen. Oh, that excites me. Because yeah. that means there's a place for me. <laughs> there's a place for you. And today, Jesus says to him, I have to stay at your house, Zacchaeus. But it moves to, today, salvation has come to this house. When you see Jesus, there is forgiveness and there is salvation. He says the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I love this photo. This was put up on Facebook and it's resonated with me as the Savior is coming looking for that lost sheep. That Christ has come to seek and to save the lost. Lost here, in the actual original word, I found this quite interesting. Lost here is the word for those who are in what? The wrong place. And so there is this idea that the person is in the wrong place and the Savior comes to bring him where? Into the right place. We think of the story, the parable of the prodigal son. That the prodigal son, the problem was he was in the wrong place. In his rebellion, he had left the father's house. And now it was time to come home where? To the right place, the father's house. That's what it means to be lost. It means that you're in the wrong place. You have wandered from God. But now he has come and he speaks your name and he searches you out. And you can find him once again. And you can be in the right place with God. A child in his household. And Jesus is on the dusty road towards Jerusalem. But he still, as the good shepherd, is searching for that one lost sheep. And his name was Zacchaeus. As we start to think about our role in a lot of this, I had to ask the hard question myself this week. Have I in any way prevented people from seeing Jesus? Have I done anything to prevent people from seeing Jesus? Do I think the church and ministry and everything is all about me and my needs? Or am I mindful that all that we do as a church, yes, is important to build up the body of Christ, for me to grow and mature in who I am in Christ, but there needs to be a place that anyone and everyone is always welcome. And that I would never do anything or say anything that would prevent people from seeing Jesus. That's a challenge. I want to see Jesus this year, but I also want people to see Jesus in me. We are, we are told that we are the ambassadors of Christ. We are told that we are the aroma of Christ, as Pastor Mike will be doing on Wednesday night. We are told that we are now the light. We are the salt of Christ. And so there is a desire that, that I want people to see Jesus more in me. I heard about the revivalists. It's always stayed with me. And I'm not saying I'll ever be there. 
but I desire to be more like it. That he would enter into a factory and men would fall to their knees and say, how can I be saved? He, he would preach, his eyesight was so poor, he would preach this way and the word would have to be up so close to his face to see it. He didn't have all the bells and whistles and the lights and the, all the things that we think we need today for God to move. Oh, oh church. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And people could see Jesus in him. That when he preached, people fell to their knees. I think we're in a day that people need to see Jesus in this. And we need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We need to be convicted. We need to ask for forgiveness if we've done or said anything that would prevent people from seeing Jesus in us. As I bring this to a close today, do you remember Hagar in the Old Testament? I love this story of this woman. It says, thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. She also said, I have I truly seen the one who sees me? You see, Hagar was a person that had nothing to do with her. She was a slave in Egypt, and here Abraham had purchased her to go with them and be a maid to Abraham's childless wife, Sarah, who then took Hagar and gave her to her husband. Just think of the abuse here in this situation. And said, sleep with my husband so he can have an heir. And so she does so, and this is where Ishmael comes from. And when Hagar became pregnant, her and Sarah were at odds with each other. And by Abraham's reluctant permission, he gave Sarah permission that he could treat her harshly. These are the people of God. And so she fled away from her master and his wife, pregnant now. And she is in a mess and she's running away. And in that moment, the outsider, the slave, the Egyptian, an angel of the Lord shows up and tells her that God is going to care for her and that child. And she has this encounter as the outsider, not an Israelite, but as an outsider. She has this moment. She has this encounter. God shows up. And Hagar, I believe, would never be the same again. Because Hagar now says, you are the God who sees me. I have seen the one who sees me. And she is the one in Scripture who gives God a new name, which is El Roy. El Roy. You are the God who sees me. We discover that in our lowest moments, someone sees us. God sees our pain. He sees our cries. El Roy is the God who numbers the hairs on our heads, counts our every tear, and he knows every detail and our circumstances, and he calls us by name. And the actual, I find this quite interesting, the actual original Hebrew word is also a word, the root word, is also the word for shepherd. That the shepherd, where did we hear that before? That the shepherd knows me by name. We're never alone because we serve a God who sees us. We can rest knowing that God is never unaware of what we're going through. God knows when we cry buckets of tears and aren't even sure why we're sad. He might not fix every circumstance we're going through and every problem we encounter, but he will never leave us and his presence is sure and he knows us and he sees us and he is our El Roy. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. I want you to know today you're not invisible. You're not alone. You're not forgotten. You're not rejected. You have significance. You are valued. And above everything, you are loved. There is
is a God who sees you, knows you by name, knew you as the psalmist said, David said, in your mother's womb. He knit you together there and had a purpose and a plan for your life. And even though you might be lost and on the wrong path, Jesus is calling you by name today. He's asking you, can I come to your house? Notice that he doesn't just show up in your house in your life. Zacchaeus had to say, yes, Lord, I invite you in. And maybe today for some of us it is the first time that we would invite God into our hearts and lives. Maybe it's been we've been doing it our own way and we admit that we're on the wrong road and it's time for us to get back to the Father's house and it's time for us to invite Jesus into our home and into our lives to come and have fellowship with us. And church, I want to challenge you as I've been challenged this week. I want to see Jesus. I want a new experience with him. I'm not satisfied with the experience from last year, 10 years ago, or back in 1984. I want a new, fresh move of God in my life. And I want to help others to have it too. I want to be a conduit, not a roadblock, a conduit to the move of God. I pray there's others that would say amen, Pastor. That's me too. And would you stand to your feet? I'm going to pray, but I just want to leave you with this. Oh, sorry. We don't need to put the slide up, Edward. I just love what Job said. Job said this in his worst of worst days. Remember the story of Job? Everything has been ripped away from him. And he has an encounter with God. God sets Job straight. And Job in that moment says, My ears have heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Some of us can be raised in the church for decades, and we have heard about God. We have heard how God has moved in other people's lives. Well, God wants to move in your life. May you be able to say what Job said in this year. My ears have heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Lord, help us today. I pray where anyone and everyone finds themselves today, we know from this passage of Scripture, Jesus is already there. Jesus is wanting to get us back on track, as we heard last week, stay on track. Some of us need to get back on track. I pray that people today would know that you know their situation, you love them, they are valued, and you know them by name, and you are inviting yourself into their lives and into their homes. I pray, Lord, we would say, yes, Lord, come. Come and have your way in my family. Come and have your way in my marriage. Come and have your way in my life. May this be the day for some of salvation, because God, you come, Jesus, to seek and to save the lost. And thank you, Lord, we indeed were lost, and you came and found us. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Our call at this song today is if you want to get back on track with the Lord, if you want to say, Pastor, I want to be a conduit for people coming to know the Lord this year, whatever, how God has spoken to you this Sunday, however you want to respond, come, stand, stand at the front and say, this is my declaration today. I want to make a commitment a new commitment, a fresh commitment to Christ. It might be the first time. It might be the thousandth time. Praise God, we can still come. <laughs> There's always grace at the front of this church. And so as we sing this song, I invite you to come, and we would love to pray with you today. More importantly, he would love you to come to him today. God bless you.
when you speak to us, when you challenge us. We thank you for our church family. We thank you for a place to come. We thank you for a place that we can love on each other and pray for each other and encourage one another and spur each other on. We thank you today, Lord, for all of that. We thank you for this first Sunday of this year. We pray for those praying at the altar that this would be a moment when they would see, I saw Jesus. I think of Isaiah. I just prayed for someone, but I think of that passage of Isaiah. In the worst time in his life, when the king had died and he was grieving, he says, I saw the Lord high and exalted and lifted up. That's the prophet of the Lord. And his life was never the same after. God, I pray that this would be the year of visions and dreams, of changes and turnarounds and transformation. And God, it doesn't take the first Sunday of the year to believe that. You can do that at any time, Lord. But we are reminded as we have this new year spanned out in front of us, we now surrender it to you and to your Lordship. We surrender these needs that have been spoken and unspoken at the front of this church. But we also surrender now, Lord, those quiet, hidden things that haven't been shared with anyone. But God, you see, you know, and you care. And so we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name. I just repeat those words again, Job, as our benediction today. And I ask you to go quietly in respect of those that are praying. My ears have heard of you. But now, my eyes have seen you. That is my prayer for you this year. That's the prayer for